Well, thank you very much uh, for giving us this opportunity to talk about this very important subject of cybersecurity for not-for-profits, a subject that, um, in our experience, does not get discussed often enough. And we have the great privilege today of a very high-powered panel of um, cybersecurity experts. Uh, Ron Mortry to my right, who's the chairman of C5 in the US, who's had a very distinguished career in the national security community, serving in several uh, leading intelligence uh, agencies. Uh, on my left, uh, Mark Destoni, who is the president and CEO of SAP National Security, uh, who also served in, in the military. Um, Joe Spezio from uh, Amazon Web Services, who is the leading solution architect for not-for-profits based out of Washington. And our not-for-profit leader, Ambassador Maura Harty, who is the president of the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And I'm going to kick off the session by just asking um, our cybersecurity experts to lift the curtain, to lift the veil a little bit, and tell us what is happening in the cybersecurity landscape at the moment. What is the cybersecurity environment in which not for profit organizations and also large enterprises and governments uh, have to deal with at the moment? And I'm going to turn to my friend and colleague, Ron, oh, thank to you. give us his observations. Sure. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. Um, it's a pleasure to be out here briefing you and talking to you about this very important topic. I always start my discussions with people of asking them, have they ever heard of an agency called NSA, National Security Agency? Raise your hand, anybody. Heard of it, didn't say, wow, great, great. You have your phones on right now? I hope you do. Uh, I was the number three guy at NSA. I was the director of operations there um, until about 18 months ago. And I uh, joined C5 to be their US chairperson and to help them as they work through cybersecurity issues. The cybersecurity landscape is um, it's one that uh, is fraught with issues, it's fraught with challenges right now. And uh, there are a lot of nation state actors, non-nation state actors, hacktivists who are out there who are willing to attack companies regardless of their size, regardless of their cause or their purpose, if you will. So they're really agnostic as to how large you are, how small you are, or what your business is. And, and many of you have probably heard of a, uh, a virus that was out there recently called the WannaCry virus. Anybody heard of WannaCry? Ransomware that was put out there. Um, and reportedly, it was developed by um, a, a national security agency, my former agency. I can't confirm or deny that, but uh, supposedly it was taken, mutated into a weapon, and put out there. And what we're going to see uh, in the cybersecurity environment, I believe, is a lot more of this. You're going to see a lot more hacktivists come out. There are a lot of targets that are out there. Everyone here is a target, whether you're an individual, or whether you're a corporation, whether you're a non-for-profit. We'll get into a little bit of that uh, later. But we're going to see more attacks. We're going to see them come more frequently. And I believe what we're going to see is the cost that it takes on businesses is going to be higher and higher. So I'll stop there and I'll turn it over to my other colleagues who might want to talk a little about this environment. Mark, uh, what do you see in SAP uh, NS2? You know, it's, it, it's interesting. Um, we've had the commercial internet now for maybe 25, 26, 27 years, right? Prior to that, we had a intranet inside government. And, um, you know, we've gotten great I mean, probably the greatest revolution since the Industrial Revolution, most of which I wasn't around for, although I guess maybe I was around <laughs> for some of it, compared to some of my colleagues here who are younger. But, I mean, really, when you think about the economic wealth that's been derived out of it, it's a fascinating uh, thing. And then, you know, clouds and all these wonderful things that are part of it. I think if you look back and you look at the total impact of the cyber problem historically, in retrospect, it's not a huge piece, but it's exponentially becoming more of a threat. And I think that's why it's becoming more top of mind. And you know, people talk about the cyber Pearl Harbor, um, and, and I'm not sure if we're ever gonna have a cyber Pearl Harbor, but we need to really address these things and we need to become more aware as citizens and as companies and as nonprofits. And by the way, nonprofits and companies are in a similar boat. They're still trying to learn what to do here. It's not like the nonprofit community is any worse or better off, frankly. 
But you know, we need to become more informed because more and more devices are being connected, which means more and more risk. So it's always gonna be a risk management game. It's kind of like every day we get in a car. Most of us here probably have vehicles, maybe millennials don't have as many. But we drive a car and, that, and we have new technologies on those cars that help us make sure to really keep the risk of accident down. We have to do the same thing here. We have to shrink the risk aperture, make sure that our hygiene is good both as individuals and companies. And I think that's going to be the biggest challenge for us over the next few years in this regard. So um, cloud computing has really been a game changer for, yeah. s for cybersecurity. Mm. Uh, when we started investing into Cloud-based companies in C5, many people saw cloud as a blocker for cybersecurity. Now we say uh, cloud is part of the solution. Now, particularly in the nonprofit space, we have a broad array of, of, of organizations of various sizes. We have some very, very large organizations. We have lots of very small organizations. Uh, the difference between some of the nonprofit, in the nonprofit space and some of the commercial space is that we tend to have even fewer folks or, or a larger number of folks who may have fewer resources to dedicate to security. Uh, most folks want to keep it lean, keep focused on their mission. And um, the cloud can really help with that because when you, when you have a cloud-based environment, you benefit from everyone else who uses that cloud. So where you have governments using that cloud, where you have large corporations using that cloud, where you have industries like motion pictures or healthcare or, or any other regulated environment, uh, finance that, that, that use that cloud, the cloud must meet the, the security requirements of all those concurrently. And when you're a, a tiny organization that doesn't have security folks to focus on your infrastructure, the ability to leverage what's already been done for all those other industries is already baked in. And you get the benefits not only of, of that security, but also the economies of, of, of scale that come with that cloud. And you can then bring that to bear for your organization, allowing you to focus your resources on the higher level issues of your mission and, and of security at the, at the application level and, and uh, process and governance levels. So keeping your, the front door locked while we keep the back door and the fort secure. I think there's an often a, a mis misnomer that the cloud is less secure. We hear that yep. all the time. I would attest that you know, there may be some more risks associated, but overall it's far more secure from, based upon what Joe said here. Absolutely. To be in a cloud environment than to be in a distributed environment. Well, Maura, you're a leader of a not-for-profit organization that helps to find missing children, and Teresa highlighted in a keynote address this morning the work that you are doing with um, Amazon Web Services. But in this space of cybersecurity, uh, failure is not really an option. What is your perspective on cybersecurity as a not-for-profit leader? Uh, thank you, Andre, and thank you for allowing me to be part of this panel today. And I will say first that as an organization that has just recently moved to a cloud-based uh, system, I feel better already. Uh, <laughs> I'm taking everyone's card from this panel as well. Uh, some of the things that I'll have to say relate to uh, sort of a small organization, a small not-for-profit, which is what we are, but uh, I think they are relatable to everyone here, no matter the size of your not-for-profit, and probably no matter if you are, in, in fact, in a for-profit environment. A couple of things, or several things that we deal with that are true are what Andre said, excuse me, said first. Uh, we really do uh, build a relationship with our donors, and that database is critical to us. There are several other kinds of data that we have that are also very important to us, but operationally and reputationally, if the data that relates to donors, the private information that we have about donors is in any way misused or breached, we lose that donor, and I'm sure that that would have a cascading effect across the many relationships that we have. So that's a critical element. Uh, we want to be a good employer. We want to be an attractive employer. As a not-for-profit, we actually have a steady stream of interns who come through the organization. That itself is, in a sense, a little bit of a vulnerability because every semester, three times a year, we bring in 15 to 20 young people uh, all mostly second year law students and grad students who uh, need to be reminded of sort of proper procedure, good uh, work habits, data hygiene. And that's a little bit of a vulnerability. It's one that we hope that we manage well. We have um, a board that is assiduously concerned about the welfare of the organization, but in meaning no disrespect to my board at all, there is a uh, 
a divergence of knowledge and of opinion with respect to the importance of cybersecurity, in fact, even to the degree that some might wonder why we chose to hire somebody who does this for us for a living. Why is the next hire that we made uh, a CIO rather than something else? Because going back to the first point I made, uh, without the donors, we are really out of business. And the fourth and final point I'll make at, at this point, Andre, is just simply that um, the donors who we adore, uh, in fact, have well-controlled enthusiasm for uh, seeing their donation go to anything beyond program. So the cost of the infrastructure that we create to protect them and us and perform the mission uh, is a source of a creative tension that at times can keep us up at night, uh, literally, because it is a, an interrelated circle of everything that we do, and we cannot afford uh, to let our guard down in any of those areas. Warren, that's very, very, very insightful. Um, you touched on a very important point, which is the role of leadership, the role of your board, the importance of governance. Ron, um, in your experience, how do you start to educate your board about the importance of cybersecurity, and, and how do you get your board to actually become a leader and a champion for cybersecurity inside an organization? One of the first things I think you have to do is explain to the board that cybersecurity is not the CIO's issue, it's not the CTO issues, or it's not the technical person's responsibility. It's everybody who's entrusted with that organization has a responsibility to understand cybersecurity and to ensure that there are good policies, practices, and overall good governance with that organization's cyber hygiene and their cyber practices, if you will. And I've spoken to people who are board members of big organizations, one organization in particular is spending $600 million a year on cybersecurity. It's a big financial corporation. You're not going to have that type of money to spend on, and, and you're not going to have the same issues that they would have either. But it doesn't matter if your business is a, a, a billion dollar a year business or a small three person, ten, twenty thousand dollar a year business. Having proper cyber hygiene is everyone's responsibility. Every individual who touches a keyboard, any individual who has access to information, anybody who talks to a donor, anybody who accepts information or sends an email must have good cyber hygiene. And once you explain that to everyone and you talk about the potential cost, then they quickly begin to grasp and understand that it really is our responsibility. And if we want to maintain our credibility, if we want to maintain the confidence in the organization, they will continue to, to try to proliferate good cyber hygiene throughout the organization. Mark, what is your experience of working with boards on this issue? You know, Ron, Ron makes some really good points, but I, I would I'd encapsulate very, uh, very, um, which is a, a one point that really make, is probably the most important. Cybersecurity is not a technical problem. It's a governance leadership problem, and Ron's exactly right. Uh, people have a tendency to run away from it because it's, oh, it's complicated. You know, let me have somebody else worry about it. But as I know we've discussed in the past in other forums, it's like having a finance committee. If you have a, a governance board, it starts with them, the director, the executive director of the nonprofit. It's very important to make sure that, A, that you've done, you've baselined your organization against known standards for security, and then, B, when you've identified those gaps, what are you doing? What's the plan? How are you going to do that? Is it? Well, maybe we move to a cloud infrastructure because we can eliminate a bunch of these problems, or we need to make sure that we have a process to make sure we patch ourselves correctly, our systems correctly, or do we have an education program, and where do I find those resources? Those are the kind of things a board can make sure happens, and the CEO or the executive director may have, need to make happen. None of that's technical, by the way. That's, yeah. Yeah. Um, the British government uh, today published a report saying that charities can and should be doing more uh, on their own cybersecurity as part of a general health check on the cybersecurity in the UK. Um, I think the panel touched on a very important theme of leadership, mm. which doesn't re uh, require funding. Um, it's a resource that all organizations have. But what are some of the very practical things 
that a, a not-for-profit organization should be thinking about when it considers its cybersecurity? If I might, I think that it's really important to have on the board someone who's not afraid to have the kind of conversation that Mark alluded to. If you, you're not likely to make the entire board experts in the subject, but just in the same way that you have a, an audit committee or a governance committee or a, a personnel-related committee, if you can have one where several, at least, of your board members are educated enough to bring to the rest of the board an issue, if there is one, or to connote to the entire organization the seriousness of purpose which, which caused you to create that committee in the first place. Um, you know, the, the Colin Powell used to say uh, when he ran the, the State Department that the troops pay attention to what the general inspects. Mm. And so you, I think that what you have to do is model the behavior you hope others would emulate, both in the, uh, in the corporation as well as on the board. Yeah. Andrea, I, I think just from a, a practical perspective, <laughs> and I'll, I'll use the WannaCry uh, virus as an example. Um, I was talking to a number of groups the week that the WannaCry virus came out and people were saying, oh my God, Ron, how could NSA allow this to happen? What are you going to do about this? How can you help? How is the U.S. government going to get involved in helping us unlock the ransomware that's on these hard drives around the world, these hospitals and other places that are experiencing these problems right now? And um, you know what I said to people was probably if organizations would have practiced the proper cybersecurity hygiene, if they would have just downloaded on a regular basis, the security patches that are out there that, that want to be downloaded. So the security patches say, I'm going to update your system. Do you want me to do it? A lot of people go, no, defer, defer, defer. You know, I, I'll do it in a week or whatever. When those patches come out, when those updates to, to your security profiles come out, let your machine update. That blocks probably 90% of the malware that's out there because, as was made, the point that was made by Mark and Joe already is that you have the you have the institutional knowledge in the cloud of all these cybersecurity experts who are helping to find malware, helping to mitigate malware, and they're just pushing it out to you. So one, if you could just download the right security patches and software, you probably get rid of most of that. And then the other piece that, uh, that we ought to spend some time talking about is the insider threat. And the insider threat is not an Edward Snowden. Anybody heard of Edward Snowden? Mm -hmm. Okay, so he worked for my organization, he worked there when I was the deputy director of operations. Insider threat, NSA, most sophisticated, one of the most sophisticated organizations in the world, cybersecurity experts, insider threat takes us. Um, well, just thinking about the cyber hygiene, how people allow people to use their passwords or to, to log into systems, watching what people do, making sure that individuals, most importantly, don't click on yeah. attachments. Right? And there are just so many ways that cyber, malicious cyber actors are thinking about, how can I get to you? How can I get to an, organ how can I get to an organization like Amazon or Google or whatever? I would send something out that says something like, we're going to change the menu, right? We're going to change the menu of food that we're, we're providing in the organization. Or we're going to revisit the policy of giving you free food. Here's why. Click on this, on this link to find out why we're doing it. <laughs> I guarantee you probably a third of the people and a high-tech organization would click on it, not because they're you know, not cybersecurity conscious, they're just worried about, well, our free food is gonna go away. So what cyber, malicious cyber actors do, they actually find things that your organization would be interested in, and then they make something out of that. And it's just fascinating, well, it's not fascinating, it's terrible, but it's fascinating, mm -hmm. how often it works. So having insider cybersecurity awareness yeah. is just as important as the firewalls and other things that are put out there and that people understand are harder to breach, so now they're going to insider tricks, if you will, to make people click on these things. So. Yeah, we heard um, Nancy Brown this morning from the Heart Association talk about some of the things you do to keep your, yourself healthy in, in, in terms of your heart. I think there's an analog here in terms of cybersecurity. It's not always easy. There are some steps you have to take in terms of that hygiene, but you don't want to wait till after the heart attack to do that. Um, I, I think folks tend not to uh, take those steps because they're not default. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's important to do those. Things like using least privilege capabilities. So somebody like Edward Snowden doesn't have access to everything. They have access to what they need for their job. Um, there, there are some things you can do to, to, look to that don't cost a lot of money to keep your environment secure. The other thing that's, that's really uh, important is to, you know, at Amazon, when we build um, 
environments, in infrastructure. We, we've always, we always say our, our C CTO, uh, Werner Vogel, says um, everything fails all the time, referring to hardware and data centers, and things, things break. Um, that allow, when you build an environment, you build uh, redundancy into that environment, you build uh, continuity into that infrastructure. The same goes for your business continuity. You need to build the, the ability to recover quickly. So if you do get malware, you know, so some of the uh, ransomware that's coming out now has no ability to decrypt. It, it, it's, and once it's encrypted, it's gone. There's no ransom that's going to get it back. You need to be able to recover quickly. And it, it, the cloud enables you to do that uh, very effectively by compartmentalizing your, your infrastructure, by having data uh, secondary environments that are easy and fast and inexpensive to stand up, and a recovery point and recovery time that are manageable and allow you to continue your business, aside from, from data being exploited outward, but at least you can get back online and, and keep your, uh, your operations going. So there are some things you can do there. But it does take a little bit of hygiene and a little bit of uh, forethought. I, I think in, in an ironic way, it's the, the, the publicity around this malware and, and the ransomware is actually very helpful to folks. It brings it home so that they can see that this is real, that, that large organizations and small ones, if you're a small, Nonprofit, you're just as likely to get the lunch menu change email from a spear fisher as a large one. Um, they're going after everyone. Some of these things come in through various vectors, uh, so you're not immune just by uh, obscurity, security by obscurity. Uh, you need to prepare, and uh, we can help you do that. Oh, that's a plan. Yeah. I think I think uh, one of the points that you know the insider threat isn't Edward Snowden, as, as Ron said. It's you know, as I often look in the mirror, I said, I've met the enemy and it's me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the person, you know, it's that inadvertent insider. And this education thing, which I think has been a theme, it's not extremely costly. But we tested inside my company now. I'm in the, we're in the security business. And of course, we sent one of these fake spear phishing notes out where I was rolling out a new bonus program. <laughs> Let me tell you, that got a lot of attention. Uh, <laughs> But no matter what, there's always a high percentage of people clicking. So, I mean, it starts with the basic awareness. And as I, I think Joe just mentioned, some of these things that have been happening more recently are making that awareness. It's, it's an opportunity to educate. And, and we've really got to spend, make the time and effort to do that. Because ultimately, most of the time when, people, when they get in, it isn't like some sophisticated attack. It's somebody letting them in the door. All this all the great technology in the world will not stop the door being open for somebody. Yeah. Well, I want to open up the floor for Q&A now, and then after we've taken some questions from the floor, I'm going to ask the panelists what um, best practices are there also from the private sector that we can apply for the not-for-profit sector. But first, I want to take some questions from the floor, if there are any. There's a gentleman and then a lady. Would you like to go first? Okay. You know, one of the questions that I have for you, I've spent my career in the public sector and talking from education to government organizations. And, you know, last year we saw the uh, attack at Deutsche Telekom where they literally used the Internet of Things against them. And the question that, um, that we're always getting asked, and, and I don't think anyone has a, a crystal ball or a magic eight ball, but I hear what you're saying on the insider threat, but with a lot of nonprofits, there's some things we can do, like you said, to kind of, you know, put proverbial duct tape to stop a lot of the hemorrhaging, but what are you all seeing um, coming down the pike in the sense that, you know, um, I'm from California, and last week we had the berserker bear virus where Russia was going through different counties trying to get their information as the election gets ready. We've seen uh, the granny scam where they taught grandmothers bitcoins. Can you share just from real if there, I guess what I'm trying to do, if there's something that's sticking its head up and it might come at me, I'd rather, you know, whack-a-mole it down and know a little bit ahead, but where's a, where's a way we can learn about that or maybe get tr trained on it a little more? Thank you. I, I think the, the thing that Ron pointed out before is probably the single biggest thing you can do, and that's make sure your environments are patched, you, that you run your updates, that you do those basic things. Most of these exploits... Um, anyone that you've seen that has a name that's in the news has been out there for a while and is almost always based on something that is an older exposure. It's not something that happened yesterday. Those things are usually patched in a hurry and available for updates. Um, so that's the single biggest thing you can do. I mean, there are other things you can do around 
Um, we'll talk about this a little later, but that's probably the simplest thing that comes to mind for me. No, I think I would weigh in and say basically the same thing. You're going to be chasing yesterday's malware if, you, if we say, look at this today or look at this tomorrow. What I'd like to say, what I always like to say when I'm speaking to groups is what you hear on the news, and I did this when I was in London speaking right before the election last year, and people were asking me, whether or not the Russians were involved in the, uh, the election. And I said, well, the U.S. government's talking about it now, right? And they said, yes. And I said, so whenever the U.S. government starts talking about an issue or talking about a problem, they've known about it for probably a year, maybe a year and a half or so, they've been looking at it. But they had to look at it, they had to isolate it, they had to make sure that they can do attribution, that where it's from and everything else. And they've seen it, and they, then, even then, you just get the tip of the iceberg. But what happens is, there's a lot of work in the cybersecurity community, whether it be the national community, working with the private sector, working with the providers of, of services, if you will, operating systems people, working with cloud providers. And there are a lot of national security professionals who are now embedded in some of these uh, cloud providers, if you will. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at these things, and as, uh, as Andre said, you have the benefit of all that if you just download a patch. You get all that for free. You don't have to pay the cost of what it would cost for a national security person to come sit on your staff. All of that information is put into those patches that are out there and they're put on there. It's not something to be frightened of, by the way. I, I think you can be very frightened about cybersecurity and say no matter what we do, uh, we're not going to get ahead of this. There are a lot of really smart people who are taking the time now to understand how malware, midi or how it proliferates, how it spreads, how people are actually behaving uh, to, to click on things. And we're trying to build in protections and, and other things that will help prevent a lot of this. But right now, I think the thing today to do is, is probably uh, twofold. One, download whatever cybersecurity patches are out there for your, your device, whether it be handheld, your desktop, your servers, whatever. And then two, educate your people. No matter how important an email may seem, they have to ensure that they are not prone to clicking on something just because it says this is really important, you have to read this right now. Uh, just click on this link. That's just a recipe for disaster, if you will. You had a question there? Yes, hi, my name is Denise and I work at Fisher House Foundation. I have two questions. One is we trust our vendors and provider, our service providers quite a bit, whether it's the database or the server. Do you have any suggestions of what we should be doing to ensure that they are following what they say they're following? And then also, uh, we use free services out there like Trello and Asana. They are project management services. They're great tools. Any suggestions, thoughts there? Mark? You know, I think the thing you got, you, I was going to mention on the last question, it kind of plays into this. It's, it's about simplicity at a level, too. And, you know, you need to look at those providers. You know, the big providers, the big cloud providers, or the big service providers that provide, like, application capabilities generally are going to be fairly secure. There is no perfect risk-free solution, okay? But, you know, if you have an environment where you're managing, say, a Wi-Fi networks or set of Wi-Fi networks, servers, and that, that adds complexity. That means you're responsible for all those components. So I would look at who my providers are. The big, big ones should be pretty, you know, we just haven't seen that much in the cloud exploitation area. And, and look at that, and then secondarily, look at how you can simplify your environment. If you can get to a cloud environment, there's a lot of relatively inexpensive services now offered through that. To me, it makes it a lot easier, and you have a lot less pressure on your staff to remember to download patches. I mean, they still have to do it on their PCs but, but, and their devices, but that back-end stuff can be really complicated and get, fall behind. I'll, I'll just add one point to Mark's point about the third-party vendors. Um, Malicious cyber actors and cyber actors in general are looking for the softest component mm -hmm. of your cybersecurity right. to exploit. So they're looking for that soft underbelly, I call it, where there may be a vendor, you, you may be great in terms of your cybersecurity, mm -hmm. but then there's a vendor that you're working with that just doesn't understand it, doesn't believe in it. Now you're finding less and less of that. Vendors are becoming very educated and they understand that 
they can't be responsible, and especially in the case of ICMIC, uh, or his organization, the Missing and Exploited Children, um, you can't have a vendor who's a weak link, if you will, in that chain. And so it's important that that question be asked, not necessarily by you as a member, but a board member and others. That's where you have to understand. Board members make decisions about, okay, we're gonna work with these people and we're gonna have these other vendors who are gonna support what we do. Um, I think those are questions that board members should be entrusted with asking and ensuring that the right processes and procedures are put into place to prevent those things from happening. Yeah, and from the, if you're running on AWS as well, um, there are tools at your disposal that can help you uh, provide some accountability to those providing services to you. If you have control over your own uh, account or access at least at an administrative level to that account, uh, you can run a tool called Trusted Advisor, which is part of our support offering that allows you to it will run security checks on your environment, for instance, tell you if things like ports are open and so forth. And if your vendors are, are not shutting those things down, you can at least have some accountability through tools such as that. Uh, you know, one point, we are still learning, all of us, okay, because there's infrastructure providers and there could be application providers on top of us. And, and, but we're learning quickly in this environment, I think. And, and I think overall, uh, it, companies will not last very long if they don't have this in their DNA that are providing capabilities to folks like you. Great. Well, we're going to do a wrap up. And I just want to ask each of our panel members, what best practices do you see that maybe use government or in the private sector that we can also apply in the not-for-profit sector? Ron, if we can start with you. Sure. I use the, um, the framework that's being used by the financial institutions today, so you're not going to have that type of money, as I said. But they're spending tens of millions of dollars a month to actually share information on cyber actors, on cyber malware that's out there, and, and they take all this data and they put it in this thing called a, a data lake. Don't worry about what that is. It's just a repository, if you will. But it's a repository where you can put any type of data. It can be completely unstructured. It doesn't have, a, doesn't have to have some framework to it. But they all put it there, and what that enables them to do is to say, hey, there's this really interesting code that was sent to me or a link that was sent to me. And um, is it something that I should use or is it something that we should use in our organization? So this data lake is being used by financial organizations and then they take that information and they push that out or they make it available, I should say, to any and everybody who is on the financial institution framework, if you will. So all your major banks and, and financial uh, organizations have this partnership. They don't compete with one another, and, and neither should non-for-profits. You shouldn't be competing with the next non-for-profit. Sometimes it, it appears that you're uh, competing for donors, but you're really not. And so in a utopian world, what I think we should have and what we should talk about sometime after this is a framework that would allow the same structure that big organizations are using and spending tens of millions of dollars to do be at least conceptualized by an organization like Amazon. If you're writing on Amazon's cloud, maybe we can think about how we could do this and allow data that might help you protect your organization proactively be put into some framework that you can tap into. And, or if you're, if you're using Amazon's web services or any web services, you will, you, you'll automatically have the benefit of that. So that's what I would see as kind of a best practice framework, just looking at what's being done in the private sector. And, and people are always worried about how much will it cost, how much will it cost. A lot of this can be done for relatively little money, if you will. It's the framework that has to be thought through and set up. So that's what I would uh, recommend. As a leader of a nonprofit, I uh, would say first, we got a lot of great advice here today from these gentlemen. So anything that, uh, uh, that we haven't done yet, we certainly will do uh, back home. But I also believe it important to strike a balance. Uh, we've heard about lots of free stuff, about a lot of uh, things that are easy to do. We just need to exercise as leaders gentle pressure relentlessly mm -hmm. to make sure that our teams do it. And to evangelize a little bit about this when you talk about um, uh, third parties upon whom you depend or with whom you work. And to make sure, again, that you are always uh, modeling the kind of behavior you expect everybody in the organization and everybody you are associated with to engage in, if that from time to time also means raising it up to the level of your board so that they too can understand what you're doing. It is not to supplant the mission you exist to do, but it is to fortify your ability to do that mission well. Sure. Uh, there are lots of things that 
organizations can do that don't cost any money. Um, the most important thing to do is, is to have some planning mm -hmm. and to focus on what you're looking to, uh, to do strategically in terms of your, your uh, cybersecurity. Things like adding multi-factor authentication or uh, figuring out who should have what privileges mm -hmm. rather than just going with giving everyone all privileges, using um, identity and access management instead of giving everyone root access to your accounts. Those kind of simple things require some planning and thought, but don't cost any extra money. Uh, taking advantage of those uh, can go a very long way in keeping your environment secure. Uh, we have a team of, of uh, architects, uh, solutions architects who work with me here at AWS. Um, our job is to help you do that. So feel free to reach out to your AWS account exec and we'll, have, we'll happily come over and help you go through some of the best practices. We have a service called Well Architect that we can help you walk through these best practices and make sure that your uh, workloads are, are going through, uh, are, are up to stuff in terms of security as part of the overview. So happy to, to do that. Yeah. And that's a terrific offer. Mark? Um, all I would say is I have the uh, opportunity, to, my night job is, is I run a nonprofit on top of my day job, which is a company. and. So I, I empathize quite a bit with, with the group here. Take an interest in this issue. If you become interested, then your team will become interested. Edu you know, educate yourself and then educate team. There are a lot of tools out there to do that. And understand where your biggest risks or vulnerabilities are. What's the most important thing inside your, 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 your nonprofit? Is it my donor database? Is it other PII? And that's the thing you have to be most concerned about. And then, you know, finally, put it in perspective. You run nonprofits, we run companies. This is one of a series of, of things that we have to worry about. But it's a risk mitigation thing. So, you know, build a risk management plan, just like you would for anything else that you do. And, you know, I think we sometimes, things get overblown a little bit. But, you know, it's not overblown when it happens to you, right? So. You'd understand that too, so thank you. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for our panelists for your advice and for your guidance. And I think some very good initiatives have come from the discussion on which we'll follow up. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>